This lecture is going to be for chapter 8. I'm going to go pretty fast through it because a lot of it is fairly self-explanatory. Don't forget that you do have the PowerPoint and a PDF within Schoology and so you guys can still access all the, the terms and the definitions and things that you need to have. If you go through here and you still have questions at the end, you can ask me those when we conference next. So to start you out in this chapter, it starts with just what's a definition of a joint. Um, this is an old school joint replacement. Um, they don't look like this anymore. This one actually looked like it was in fairly decent condition, but they're still having to go in and replace it. Um, whenever they do joint replacements, they don't last for as long as the person does, and so you do generally have to go in sort of like a car and get your, your joint repaired because the parts have worn out after a certain point. Um, this person, same thing, they had the joint repair, but then they got an infection after the surgery, they didn't go to a doctor, and so this was not opened by a doctor. This opened up due to an infection that they had, and so when you work in this industry for any length of time, you're going to see people who aren't taking care of themselves like they're supposed to, and they end up with pretty horrific injuries, and this is just one of those. The next thing that your book does is it starts to classify joints, and there's two ways that you can do that. You can classify joints based on what they're made of, that structural classification, and your three options for that are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, or synovial joints. Or you can classify joints based on how much movement is allowed. That's a functional classification system. And your options for functional classification are synarthrosis, no movement, amphiarthrosis, a little bit of movement, and then diarthrosis, which is freely moving. So there's those terms defined for you guys. I just said them a second ago, so you should be good there. After that, you have what are the three types of fibrous joints discussed in the book and provide examples. This picture from your book hits all of those. So sutures, we talked about those. You had to learn some of the names of them, like there's the frontal or coronal suture, there's the squamosal suture, there's the lambdoid suture, um, there's also the sagittal suture that you can't really see in this picture that separates the two parietal bones from each other. So those sutures are gonna be sin arthrotic joints because there's no movement that happens in between those. Um, I already said that one. So a syndesmosis is when you get a little ligament that connects a couple of bones together, like this is between the tibia and the fibula. Depending on the length of those fibers, you might get a little bit of movement, so it's an amphiarthrosis, but if the fibers are really short, it's not going to allow any movement, and so they can be synarthrotic as well. Your last option is a gomphosis. This is how your teeth get held into either the maxilla or the mandible, depending on whether they're upper or lower teeth. Um, your teeth shouldn't be moving, so these are all synarthrotic joints. After that, you have cartilaginous joints. There's two kinds. This is the picture from your book that hits each of those. So a synchondrosis is when you have hyaline cartilage that connects two bones together, like between the ribs and the sternum. That's a synchondrosis. These usually don't move around, so they're synarthrotic. A symphysis is when you have fibrocartilage that connects a couple of bones together. So your intervertebral discs and your pubic symphysis are some examples of some um, symphyses. Uh, these can allow a lot of movement or they can allow a little bit of movement. It just depends on the anatomy of the joint there. Um, this one really is just for fun. So this contortionist is actually sitting on their own head. One of the things that I want you to notice here is look how straight that thoracic spine is. There is very little movement that's allowed in the thoracic spine, especially along that frontal plane. The lumbar spine is pretty bendy, the cervical spine is pretty bendy, but this isn't. And so even within the spine, some of the joints are going to be um, amphiarthrotic or even diarthrotic, and some of them are going to be amphi or synarthrotic. It just depends on what's happening. If you think about what's in the thoracic cage, you've got your heart and your lungs, you really don't want to be smushing those as you bend around, and so that's why that area doesn't move around a lot along the frontal plane. Next up, you have anatomy of a synovial joint. This is your third type of structural classification. This is the basic anatomy that you're going to have. This is the most simplistic anatomy you're going to have for a synovial joint. So you got two bones coming together. We've got a fluid-filled space that separates those two bones. We have hyaline cartilage or articular cartilage that's at the ends of both of those bones. That prevents bone from rubbing up against bone. We have the synovial membrane, which secretes the synovial fluid. And then we're going to have a fibrous capsule and then ligaments that help to reinforce that membrane to help keep everything nice and stable. Um, you should have already had that labeled, so life is good. I'm just going to kind of run through these really fast. Again, this prevents bone from rubbing up against bone. Articular capsules just helping to reinforce everything. Remember, you can pause the video to get whatever you need from the slide. Synovial membrane secretes the synovial fluid. Synovial fluid works a lot like motor oil. Where motor oil helps to lubricate the metal parts in your engine, synovial fluid is lubricating the parts of a joint to make sure, again, bone's not rubbing up against bone. We're doing everything we can to reduce friction. 
The more friction you expose your joints to, the more pain you're going to be in later in life. Um, let's see, synovial fluid we already did. Reinforcing ligaments is what you guys have next. Oh, wait. I have a video back here that I was going to skip this way. I need to look at my notes. So a little video of them extracting some synovial fluid from a person, if I remember correctly. EDFTheVideo.com. Thank you. Take a moment to visit theedxitvideo.com. No, I'll talk through it so that we can learn. So, the, the swelling happened a few days uh, ago. It's been there constantly. I'm going to skip a bunch. Just like I've been seeing, okay? Okay. I know a pinch. Don't pull back. Okay. Bear with it. Right. All right. He's just entering the local anesthetic so that the rest of this procedure doesn't hurt. So, I'm going to come back to later on. Here we go. So that fluid that he's drawing out of that joint, that's synovial fluid. Um, it's a filtrate of the plasma, but that's what it looks like. Now he's putting some into this cup because he's going to be culturing that. Well, he was going to be culturing that until he spilled it. Um, because the person has an infection in this case. So this is what's known as bursitis. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But that fluid inside of there is synovial fluid. And so that just lets you see what that synovial fluid looks like. All right. Reinforcing ligaments do exactly what the name says. Articular discs are the same thing as menisci or meniscus is singular. Uh, we're going to talk about these more when we get to the knee joint in just a little bit. Bursa is sort of like fluid-filled bubble wrap. It's something that can protect some tendons and ligaments so that they don't rub directly up against bone or cartilage. And so it's just some extra protection. That video just a second ago, the person had an inflamed bursa, so they were sucking some of the fluid out of one of these little sacs. Tendon sheath, same thing, but it's long and it wraps around a tendon, so that's a bursa, that's a tendon sheath. Come back to that later, maybe we'll do it. Okay, which factors influence the stability of joints? Articular surface. So you've got two ball and socket joints in the body. I want you to look at the difference in the anatomy between those two. When you look at the humerus, the socket is the glenoid cavity, and it's not a very good socket for the head of the humerus. It doesn't sit in there very well. This is one of the reasons why the shoulder joint dislocates so easily. It's because these two bone shapes really don't fit together all that well. Versus when you look at um, the head of the femur in the acetabulum of the coxal bone, now we have a nice deep socket for the ball to actually sit into. And so it's less common for people to dislocate the hip because the articular surfaces just fit together that much better. The more ligaments a joint has, the more stable it's going to be, but the less flexible it's going to be. One of the things that your body has to do in relation to the joints is figure out, do we want this joint to be stable, AKA it dislocates less often, or do we want this joint to be very flexible so that you have a wider range of motion? Basically, you're gonna to have to sacrifice one so you can do the other. So the more ligaments you have, the more stable it is. The fewer ligaments you have, the more flexible it is. Muscle tone. Because muscles span joints so that they can move bones, the muscle is going to maintain some tension and help to keep that in place. So one of the main things that helps to influence stability of the shoulder joint, which again has really poor articular surfaces and really doesn't have a lot of ligaments going on either, is the rotator cuff muscles, which wrap around the head of the humerus to help hold the humerus up against the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Um, after that, you have all of your movements. You can see lots of pictures of these in the textbook. So flexion, get the definition that you need. Extension is the opposite of flexion. Abduction and adduction are opposites. Something that helps students remember this is if you abduct a kid, you take it away from the parent. And so abduction is when you take a limb away from the body. Add means you're adding it back. And so this would be putting the limbs back down. Think jumping jack for this. Like abduction is the first half of a jumping jack. Adduction is the second half of a jumping jack. Um, circumduction is moving your arms or legs in a cone in space, sort of like this dude is doing. His is a very wide cone. It doesn't have to be that wide, but you're just kind of circling your arms or legs. Rotation means you're spinning it around its axis. Uh, supination and pronation are all about the forearm. Um, ordinarily, your radius and your ulna are going to be parallel to each other, and when they're in this position, you are supinated. If you flip your hand so that it faces backwards, your radius crosses over your ulna. That's pronation. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are about the toes and the foot. If you dorsiflex, you pull the toes back towards the tibia. If you plantar flex, you point your toes. 
Opposition is a thumb movement. So your thumb can flex, extend, it can abduct, it can adduct. It can also oppose, which is where it goes across and it touches the other fingers. Hopefully you guys know your primates. Primates all have opposable thumbs. This is what that movement is in reference to. After that, you have recognized the components of the knee joint. You have this picture where you're supposed to label. Um, this, you just have to call it a bursa. That's just a bursa. Yes, technically this one is the prepatellar bursa, but just call it a bursa and I'm pretty much happy with this. All the rest of those, make sure you get the names. So we got tibia, sorry, I pointed at the wrong thing. We have tibia down here. We have femur up here. We have the patella right here. I gave you this picture because you can see the two cruciate ligaments really well in this picture. The posterior cruciate ligament connects to the back of the tibia. That's why it's called posterior is because of where it attaches on the tibia. The anterior cruciate ligament, which is more commonly known just as the ACL, it connects to the front of the tibia. Then I gave you this picture. This one is to show you your two collateral ligaments. You can still see the ACL and the PCL in this image. So you got femur, tibia, fibula, patella. Uh, you can also see the minutiae very well in this picture. One of the things you need to remember is the fibula is always going to be lateral. So find the fibula and then you know this must be the lateral meniscus. So that means this has to be the medial meniscus. Now the other thing that I want to mention on the collateral, so your book calls this the fibular collateral. It's also sometimes called the lateral collateral. Uh, collateral. This one is sometimes called the medial collateral, but your book is calling it the tibial collateral. So sometimes these have different names depending on who you're working for at any given time. Next up, function for these things, patellar ligament. Um, this does help anchor the patella, but for medical purposes, this is the thing they hit with that little rubber hammer to test your knee jerk reflex. Mm -hmm. The two collateral ligaments are helping to prevent excessive rotation of the knee joint. The ACL is preventing hyperextension. Incidentally, that means if you do hyperextend your knee, this is likely to tear. Um, PCL is preventing the femur from sliding forward on the tibia, uh, the meniscii. So since there's a lot of weight being borne on the tibia, the hyaline cartilage isn't enough to protect the top of the tibia. So in addition to the hyaline cartilage, we also have fibrocartilage pads on top of that. That fibrocartilage is a meniscus, meniscii is the plural form of that. Um, these are really only anchored onto the medial side up over here really well and so it's very common that if a person injures their knee they can tear that cartilage off of the bone. Um, so the three C's for knees, these are the things that are most likely to be damaged on a person and require knee replacement or at least surgeries to help repair them. So it's the collateral ligaments, the fibular and the tibial, the cruciate ligaments, the anterior and the posterior, and then it's the cartilage, those meniscii. Your knee is most vulnerable to blows from the side or bending sideways because it's very strong front to back and as long as you don't try to hyperextend the joint, it should be okay, but if you get hit from the side, like if you're playing football or soccer is really good, a person will change position really fast, and that's how you can tear all three of these at the same time. Um, let's see, skip back to the arthroscopic surgery. This is one of the definitions towards the very end of this. If a person does, let's say, tear their ACL, in the old days, they would do this big incision all the way down the front of the knee and then repair it. But nowadays, we just make small incisions and then put instruments and cameras in the knee so that the infection rate is lower, the heal time is a lot faster. And that's because arthroscopic means we're putting a scope in, that's the camera and the microscope, and then arthro means joint. So arthroscopic is we're using cameras inside the joints. Let's see what this video is. Our technique of ACL reconstruction involves what we call a three-portal technique. After arthroscopic treatment of other problems within the knee, such as treatment of articular cartilage defects, torn meniscus cartilages, the ACL is approached by first cleaning out the intercondylar notch, taking care to obtain excellent visualization of the ACL insertion sites on the tibia and on the femur. Wall Notch plasty is performed only if necessary to improve visualization or if there is a particularly tight intercondylar notch. Once the notch is cleared, a gap is passed from the anterior medial portal exiting posterior laterally at the level of the iliotibial band. A small puncture wound is made over the tip of the gap through the skin. The rear entry guide is hooked on to the small puncture wound and brought into the knee 
with the tip being placed at the anatomic insertion site of the ACL, which we believe is somewhat lower down the wall than previously thought, usually at around the 3 or 9 o'clock position. Care is taken to ensure that the tip of the guide and the subsequent guide pin exit within a few millimeters of the posterior margin of the intercolor notch. A small portal measuring approximately one and a half centimeters is made to permit the 11 millimeter drill bit to be passed over the guide pin. In smaller knees, a 10 millimeter drill bit can be used. A curette is used to capture the guide pin and to clean the remaining tissue. A flexible suture passer is then passed to the drill hole and exits anterior medially. A triangular <coughs> hoodoo guide is then placed into the knee at the anatomic insertion site for the ACL, seven millimeters anterior to the PCL and biased towards the medial side of the ACL insertion. A drill pin is then passed to the tip of the guide. The drill pin is then over drilled with an 11 millimeter drill or a 10 millimeter drill for smaller knees. After the drill has been passed, care is taken to ensure that the knee can terminally extend and that the drill does not impinge on the PCL. The guide suture is captured and brought down through the tibial drill hole. Pinches then turn to the ACL allograft. We prefer a pre-shaped bone patellar tendon bone <coughs> allograft that has been washed with one of the cleaning techniques such as BioCleanse or Aloe Wash. The cleaning techniques produce a bacterially uh, clean graft, although there still is some risk for viral transmission. Drill holes are placed in each bone block to permit two permanent sutures placed on each end. A plastic ligament passer may be used and passed from the tibia to the femur after the holes have been chamfered free with a shaver or a Gore-Tex chamfer. Next, the ligament is passed from the femur to the tibia and clamped in order to prevent pull through of the ligament into the knee. The femoral hole is then clearly visualized and a guide pin passed on the anterior portion between the bone block and the tunnel. This area is then tapped and over drilled with a resorbable screw. The fixation is visualized with the arthroscope in the tunnel in order to ensure accurate placement and no protrusion. The knee is then cycled for 20 cycles to remove stretch in the graft and similar fixation performed on the tibial side with the knee held in 30 degrees and posteriorly subluxed in order to remove any slack from the graft. Tension is then checked again at 30 degrees the knee is taken through a full range of motion, and then it's arthroscopically checked in order to ensure that there's no impingement on either the PCL or the intercomer notch. All right, I'm gonna stop that one there. So that's how they do some ACL reconstruction if a person has torn that ligament. All right, at that point we switch to talking about the shoulder. The first thing for you guys to do is to label this picture. Once again, I'm perfectly happy with you just calling these bursa, and then this is just a tendon sheath. The joint is made by the humerus and then the scapula, specifically the head of the humerus is going to be articulating with the glenoid cavity, which is underneath all of these ligaments right here. The primary thing that helps to reinforce stability from a ligament standpoint is the coracohumeral ligament, which is this one that attaches out here on the humerus up to the coracoid process of the scapula. There are some ligaments that also blend into the capsule. Um, we'll kind of talk about those here in just a second though. So, the glenoid labrum is a little pad of cartilage that we have over the glenoid cavity. It helps to deepen the socket, but again, not a great articular surface, so it's very easy to dislocate the shoulder. This is the primary ligament that helps to reinforce stability. The glenohumeral ligaments, uh, they are usually blending into the capsule, and they're more to keep the capsule safe. They don't really reinforce all that much stability in the joint itself, and in fact, some people don't even have those ligaments, and so really this is the only one that's helping to keep everything where it's supposed to be. So earlier I mentioned the rotator cuff. It's a set of muscles that wrap around the head of the humerus and help to hold the humerus up in place against the scapula. 
Um, you probably hear of rotator cuff because pitchers injure this all the time, and that's because of vig uh, pitchers have to vigorously circumduct their arm during their pitching motion. And so that is really easy to basically cause inflammation in the rotator cuff, and then they end up having to go on the, oh my gosh, what do they call it? The DL, the disabled list, is where they have to go as they allow that inflammation to succeed in the rotator cuff muscles. So injuries, cartilage tears are exactly what they sound like. It usually takes surgery to fix because cartilage is avascular and it doesn't heal very well. Sprains, it means you have bent a joint and you have overstretched some ligaments. Uh, this is like the one thing where they say walk it off, that will help get things back where they're supposed to be, unless it was so severe that your bones aren't staying in alignment very well anymore. Uh, dislocations are exactly what they sound like. Here the person has dislocated the shoulder, so the bone ends are not in alignment anymore. Um, they have to be reduced, just like you have to reduce a break in a bone. Reduction just means you put those bone ends back together like they are supposed to be. And then you give them something like a splint so that they can keep everything where it's supposed to be. Uh, bursitis, I showed you a video of them removing the fluid from this, so this is inflammation of a bursa. It's often caused by trauma, but it can also be a bacterial infection, which she has the bacterial infection, and so she's going to need antibiotics to treat hers. Tendonitis, same thing, but a tendon sheath. Um, other problems that can happen, so osteoarthritis is the arthritis that most older people are going to get in their life. There comes a point where they've worn down the cartilage and they get bone rubbing up against bone. That's very uncomfortable for the person and then it destroys the bone as well. There's different treatment options depending on where you are, but one of the things that people can do to try to push this off further is take glucosamine and chondroitin that helps to reinforce the cartilage in the joint. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the joints and then destroys the cartilage and the joint itself. This is in its very severe form, especially on this finger right here. So not only is this a dislocated joint, but now the bones are actually fusing together so that this digit won't move anymore. Um, like all autoimmune diseases, this goes through periods of exacerbation where the arthritis is really bad, they can't get out of bed in the morning. And then it goes into remission and everything is happy and hunky-dory and they can go skipping off into the forest for a little bit. And so any of your autoimmune diseases, they're going to be marked that way. Since this is a problem of the immune system, we treat this by giving them immunosuppressants. Uh, gout is more common in men than women. Um, what happens is their kidneys don't filter uric acid out as well as they're supposed to. Uric acid can exist as sort of this chalky thing or as these little crystals. These crystals, because of gravity, settle usually around the feet and then they cause problems usually at the joint of the big toe connecting to the foot. It will spread past that point eventually. That's just usually where the symptoms get noticed at first. Um, there's videos online where you can see them removing some of those crystals from people's joints. I just didn't happen to link to any of those up here. But they can fix this by eating less red meat because the more red meat you eat, the more uric acid you make, which means the more problems you're going to have. We can also treat with colchicine. Now, colchicine is actually a poison. It will kill people who don't have gout. Um, but if a person with gout takes it, it helps to stimulate the kidneys so that we can clear that uric acid out a little bit better. Uh, Lyme disease is in this chapter because one of the main symptoms of Lyme disease is arthritis or pain in the joints, but you also get can get flu-like symptoms where you get a fever and body aches and things like that. The vector for Lyme disease is a tick. The causative agent is Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a bacterial species, so you get bitten by a tick and it spits some of the bacteria into you. We had talked about this disease earlier when we were talking about erythema back in skin because it creates erythema migrans, this rash that is also called a bullseye rash. Treatment for this is antibiotics and the antibiotics need to be given early. If it is not treated early, you can end up with lifelong complications from Lyme disease. This is just to show you, while Lyme disease is not super common in Texas, there are cases of it and so it is something that you need to be aware of if you're going to work in the industry. Um, I think on the next slide I have a really disturbing picture so I wanted to warn you about it before I got there. So what is the effect of regular exercise on joint health and structure? Well, it depends on what kind of exercise you do. If you do exercise that allows you to go through a full range of motion and does not put too much weight on the joints, that can help you maintain your flexibility and your joint health for a longer period of time. So if you think of things like swimming or yoga, those are excellent activities for your joints to be able to do to maintain flexibility and keep your cartilage nice and healthy. If you do activities that are more high impact, like gymnastics, which is why I chose these pictures off over here, or running or jumping, that tears the cartilage up more often, you're putting more weight on the joints and they are more likely to fail as you get older. So what happens with exercise depends on what kind of exercise you do. If you ever watch gymnastics, those people 
tear their joints up and they require so much surgery just to be able to maintain their competitive edge and it's because the human body was not meant to jump as high as they jump and then come back down it just puts too much stress on the joints and so they end up needing hip replacements and knee replacements they end up dislocating their shoulder all the time um, she hyperextended both of her knees and ended up tearing her ACL and so she was out for quite a while if I don't know what happened to her after this in fact for all I know she's not doing gymnastics anymore uh, we had already talked about arthroscopic surgery, so after that you just have some terms to make sure to define. I'm going to copy another quiz for you guys. It's another coloring quiz to help you out with the joints. That is going to be due later on. I'll post announcements in Black uh, Schoology. Sorry, Schoology for you.